In the last 24 years, something amazing has happened, a series of miracles having to do with the region of Mount Sinai. Jim and Penny Caldwell, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. Thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate you having us here. It's really good to have you here. And I want to hold up uh, one of your products. It's called Exploring Mount Sinai. And it's really four hours of video uh, about this region around Mount Sinai. I think everybody in the, in the Christian world would immediately recognize Mount Sinai as the mountain where the law was given. Right and where Moses uh, received the commandments from God. But wh wh there's so much more to it than that, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. First, I want to go back and sort of fill in the beginning of the story. Back in 1992, Jim, you were uh, an oil, uh, I guess, engineer in uh, Saudi Arabia. Right, yeah. We had the pleasure to go over to uh, Arabia um, and... Uh, uh, lived there. We were originally, I had promised my dear wife uh, a couple of years and that we would come back and start a hardware business. That mm -hmm. was my plan. <laughs> but um, uh, she agreed to go and we ended up staying there 12 years. And what you're seeing in this DVD is 25 years of research and an accumulation of thousands of images mm -hmm. and video. But um, back to the beginning, in 1990, after the Gulf War in 1992, at the end of 91, um, I had this vision of the Ark of the Covenant uh, being brought back to mm -hmm. the place that it was built. And that um, this happened suddenly. I was not a man prone to visions or anything like that. But it sent us on a trip into Egypt to go to the traditional location of Mount Sinai. And that's really where it all begins. It goes from that point to, uh, to the visit there and then on into, um, into Egypt. And you had to sort of bone up on the Bible, uh, according to what I saw in, in your DVD. Uh, at that point in time, you, you had a vision uh, about uh, the, the ark and right. about a man yeah. and about this region. And you had, your next job was to find out what uh, the book of Exodus said. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and just to uh, demonstrate, Bibles are illegal in Arabia. You have to smuggle them in. We were able, fortunately able to smuggle this in. But to read it, I had to actually tear the chapters out. You can see that I would tear a chapter out and bind it with tape, and then I would fold it up and put it in my pocket and sneak into the refinery at night, where I would study and go through, and you can see that it's just completely marked up, writ, you know, and, and uh, highlighted. And what I did is I, I formed an identity kit, I call it, a list of things that we would find when we went to the traditional Mount Sinai. That was the plan. And the, by the, the way, it's very detailed when you read Exodus. Uh, and I, I, it struck me when, when I heard you talking about this on your DVD that, I, that, that, that there is so much detail in, in Exodus. It gives you a mental image of what you should see. Uh, right. we, would, we would watch, we had a, a copy, a smuggled in copy of the Ten Commandments, and we would watch that with our kids every night. And I knew that Cecil B. DeMille's had used a, uh, lot, some actual video from the traditional location. So I'm looking at it, trying to see, you know, caves or mm -hmm. anything about the particular mountain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I had built this case of information. And then uh, January the 1st of 1992, we took off from Rastanura, traveled 24 hours to get to Jordan across country, broke all the Aramco rules of traveling alone in a vehicle by yep. yourself. Wow. And then we got into, uh, into the traditional location, and we were able to you know, come right up into where the St. Catherine's Monastery is and where the mountain is. And to um, be honest with you, we realized there was no connection between what we were seeing and what was written well, let's back scripture. up just a little bit because, uh, and Penny, you, you guys basically took a vacation trip at, at that point. We and, did. Uh, you, uh, you sort of 
drove off across the desert and, and, and you ended up in Egypt and you drove all the way south to the Aswan Dam and then back up again. Fill us in on that. And, we did. And, and tell Further us what, than that. what you found out. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, that's exactly what we did. And, and um, after all these days in Egypt, we entered in at Nueva, the port of Nueva. We had to take a ferry from the Gulf of Aqaba uh, from the port of Aqaba in Jordan and take that ferry over to Nueva. We entered there, went up to Cairo, all the way down to Aswan, as you said. And on our way back, we ended up at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula in a place called Sharm el Sheikh. And I found a book called The Gold Mines of Midian by Sir Richard Burton. It was mm -hmm. a reprint of a book in 1878. And a map in the back of that book showed the land of Midian actually being in northwest Saudi Arabia. And at that point, we just kind of went wild. We pulled out our maps and said, you know what? The scripture says mm -hmm. Midian is where Moses was tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro when he had the burning bush experience. And that is where God told him that, uh, you know, this is where you're going to bring the people back. Now I'd like to Egypt. say just one thing at this point in time. Uh, the, my Bible, my personal Bible, and many, many other Bibles mm -hmm. that I've looked at have maps, and you, you can look back there and see the track mm -hmm. of the Exodus. And invariably, they have the, uh, the, the Jews coming down to the south of the Sinai Peninsula right. and then circling back up to the north again. And St. Catherine's Monastery uh, down there in the south part of Sinai is generally billed as the place That's right. where they received right. the law. And you show in your video that, that, that as you looked around, and this goes back to you, Jim, you didn't see all the things that you expected to see having studied Exodus, right? This is exactly right. It was, it was such a letdown when we went there to the mountain that I, I felt that my vision was in error, that what I had thought we were going to find was totally wrong. Either that sight was wrong mm -hmm. or the scriptures themselves were not accurate, and I couldn't believe that. So we dismissed it, mm -hmm. and we spent the next 32, 33 days going through Egypt, as she said, and, but we learned a lot. We learned, we hit all the museums, we went on to the, uh, to the visited all the sites, and we saw what um, ancient things were like. We mm -hmm. studied, mm -hmm. we went through the museums, purposely looking at everything from chariot wheels to anything else uh, in the way the stone culture looked after thousands of years. Right. And we kind of got a mental image of that, in the process, coming back to Nueva, we found this book she talks about, The Gold Mines of Midian. And we, when she saw that, she opened the book up, and in the back was a map. And in that map, it talked about, Sir Richard Burton talked about uh, the land of Midian being in northwest uh, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And that re-energized us. There was an article in there by a guy named Charles Beck, Dr. Charles Beck. This is in the late 1800s, had proposed that Mount Sinai was in Arabia, had written a book, Sinai in Arabia. And I pulled out my NOAA maps and we located this spot. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was another book, uh, The God of the Mountain by, Sir Manuel, uh, by uh, Emmanuel Anadi. And he, he, on his map, shows 13 possible locations of Mount Sinai with Jebel Laws being one in Arabia. Mm -hmm. And once I saw that, it was like, this re-energized the whole uh, idea of going to Mount Sinai. So we zipped across the Gulf of Aqaba, back into Jordan, back into Arabia, and then we got to Tabuk, and we kind of used Tabuk as our hub, and we ended up going out to the mountain. That's and, right. And thus began an amazing adventure, or set of adventures, that continues to this very day. Yes, right? it does. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's not over. over. It's not over yet. And over again. It has been amazing. Now, I want to go back. I'd like to take you back to the spot when you drove into Arabia, into the region of Midian. And by the way, look it up. We're going to put it on the screen so you can see that map. But just look it up for yourself. Uh, and you, you can find maps everywhere. And, and check over in northwestern Saudi Arabia, and you will all M I D I A N. You're going to see it there, and yet it's been ignored all these years. So you drove over into this region now that is called Midian in all the maps, mm -hmm. and you started to see things that looked familiar. 
That you might expect to see, having read the book of Exodus, right? Absolutely. One of the things that was gravely missing when we entered into the traditional site was uh, we didn't even see any uh, petroglyphs or the carving on the rocks. You know, you'll see this text that's called the Mudic on the rocks in many, many regions throughout all of this area, Mm -hmm. but we didn't see anything like that heading into the traditional site. Almost as soon as we crossed back into Arabia and got down into this area, we entered it from the south, and we started seeing this writing on the rocks. And we started seeing huge evidence of stone circles round about, and many of them. Uh, And after being there for a few years and going out in the desert, we knew that these were very ancient um, uh, parts in the landscape. They were definitely left there from thousands of years. So as we began to to head further north into the heart of where this area is, we came upon a fenced off area, had an archaeological warning sign. In other words, don't go trespassing in here. Mm-hmm. It's not allowed. And as we went around the side of this, we began to see these ancient cattle on the rocks. And they were very, very clear. Uh, and they were in two different forms. Um, and as we looked at that, we immediately began to think, goodness gracious, possibilities here. Could this really be the area um, where the golden calf was worshipped? I mean, that hit us right, right off the bat. And having ar- uh, archaeological evidence on the ground so quickly, as soon as we entered into mm-hmm. that area, it was just like, my goodness, we've yeah. already seen more here than we saw at the traditional site. Uh, over there in Mount Sinai, at, Saint, at, Saint in the land of Midian, Monastery, mm-hmm. which is right. really not the right site. That's correct. And you're quick, That's, we, we don't believe it's the right site yeah, anyway. Yeah, you're, you're quick to say that. Uh, and, but what you're, and I'm listening to you, what you really began to see was evidence that, that a long time ago a lot of people had been in this area that is now deserted. That is precisely right. Now, who were the people? And, of course, that's a leading question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we firmly believe it was the Israelites that that Moses led out of the land of uh, Egypt. And uh, the more we began to explore in Mm -hmm. that area, uh, the more we found many, many, many more things. Absolutely, in that area, there were a huge number of people at one time. There's just too much on the ground for that not to have been a fact. It wasn't always easy going, uh, was it, Jim? Uh, for example, on that first trip, <clears throat> you told me you got arrested. You know, it sounds, it sounds like we just <laughs> breezed in and out of these places. Uh, it really does. And, and I look back on it and I think, uh, especially from this point of view, looking back in history, you think, uh, who was that guy? Were we really able to do that? It took a supernatural um, uh, strength to be able to take my wife and my family and go out into this area. And at that time, God provided. I mean, it was miraculous. And and it's like every step of the way, he was leading us to see things. If we hadn't come in from the south, number one, we may never have found the mountain. But number two, we saw important petroglyphs on rocks that have turned out to be significant in other research. Uh, research about, I always call it the chalkboards of history. This language that's written on these rocks out there is revealing information about all of this that has happened in the area, but it spreads from the Sinai region all the way into southern Arabia. It leads you on to believe where the, the wandering in the wilderness mm-hmm. went. Exactly. Now, after you uh, got out of jail, uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, after you got out, you, you just, and, and a lot of people wouldn't have done this. You decided we're going to go back, and you did. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I want you to talk about is uh, the, the, the place where all the cattle are uh, displayed on a wall, a rock wall there, and, and there seem to be what look like cattle chutes, and there are some, uh, some apparently white marble uh, fragments uh, uh, that are disc shaped or. or uh, pillar shaped, all right there in one location. Back to the Bible, what we should find on the ground, there's evidence there on the ground that matches the text exactly. And so that was part of what was amazing to me, first off, that we were had the privilege to go there to see these things. But there are pillars, and, and you, can, you can look at different things on the ground, there may be different interpretations, but the fact that there are pillars there were significant to me. 
You call them drums, you can call them uh, Neolithic, you can call them many names. But they're in but the they're, Bible. And they're in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that was significant. There are altars. There's a structure there. As a young man, I was always out at my fa grandfather's farm working on the bullpen. And the bullpen is a certain type of device that allows you to handle large animals. You have to take them down a chute, you have to turn them at an angle so their eyes, the second one coming, doesn't see what's happening. You bring them up to a place where you can slaughter them. Normally you put them in a squeeze and brand them and that kind of thing. Very difficult to handle large oxen. Well, at this location, they sacrificed oxen. You had to have a mechanism. It's there. It's on the ground. I mean, it's unbelievable. You see the chute. Still in there. The chute is there. It's still there. The altar there of, uh, where, where the animal would have been cleaned and sacrificed. And even it's ashes. Ashes. There's a pit. In, in 1994, the, the um, government had come in and they did a slight excavation. A they partial. came in there and they cut a partial through, but they excavated right where this wall was where there was... Uh, 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 earthen altar, and I call that because the Bible specifically says that at that point Moses built an earthen mm -hmm. altar, and they were sacrificing the animal. But the the point is, is that below that altar, at about four feet where the ground level was, they dug down an additional three feet and pulled ash out onto the ground, and it's, it was black as coal. Unfortunately, I didn't catch a sample of it at the time, uh -huh. and should have. But that all that, that is there. It I is. mean, it, 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 each part, you're standing there at that site, you look up, you see a cave, a la Elijah's cave. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see each one of these things. Another thing that we noticed was when you look at the top of the mountain from that perspective, you see a bluish color stone that represents or could represent this idea of God coming down on the mountain and under his feet it's were as if it were a sapphire pavement. Yes. Mm. That's there. All of these visuals that you would see in the text are actually there on the ground. Now you told me you made uh, a total on that first go around of about four trips over back, over back. Right, and, right. and I want to ask you about trip number four in which you came up to the split rock. And uh, I'd like to spend some time there. Okay. This is such a story in the Bible. Uh, the, the, everybody knows about the children of Israel suffering from uh, a, a want of food and water and they began to grumble and complain and they came to a rock and the, the, Moses uh, struck the rock and water came out. And I think most people uh, see the rock as being maybe about the size of a VW Beetle and uh, you know not a, not a real big rock. And, right. and when Moses spoke to it and the water came out maybe uh, a little stream about that wide came out, you know, uh, a few gallons. Right, right. <laughs> but that's not what you found, right? Oh, my well, goodness. Not that's not at all what's no. out there. Um, <laughs> I think it's huge. It, 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 it's so <laughs> really much bigger. Is. And that, that's one of the things that I must say throughout all of these trips. Um, I believed these stories before I ever saw these things. But one of the things that is so massively impressive to us is that our God is so much bigger than you initially think. I had the same kind of thought with you uh, from a child. You know, everybody had their little cup and there was a little yeah, trickle and right. they got their little... Just a little bit but, of water. <laughs> that's a little right. Water. Yeah. But if you no. have, yeah. quite literally, you have to think logistically, if you have the numbers that we assume came up out of the land of Egypt... And that would be approximately... 600,000 plus just men of fighting age, according to the according scripture. According to the scripture, absolutely. Uh, we, yeah. are, we are of the belief that there were millions. A lot of water. You're going to need a lot of water. Yeah. Not For only flocks. that, they've got flocks with them. They've got herds with them. If you don't have a massive miracle, but is, that, is anything too hard for God? No. Now, one of my favorite parts uh, in this video, and believe me, you're going to love it, is, is seeing uh, Penny up at this rock where the water came out. And you see, uh, is it granite? Is it what, what's it's a granite, it's okay. red granite, they and call you it. see red granite that has obviously been uh, carved by a massive flow of water. It, it takes a lot of water to carve a, a hollow space in rock. Right, it truly does, and and we even have pictures of ourselves sitting in. I I remember that uh, some of these areas that are hollowed out. So so thousands of gallons of water had to be flowing out of there. Oh, we think so, and and the whole area down the rock is massive. It sits up on a hill of boulders that's mm -hmm. probably 200 feet high or so. The rock itself is 50 to 60, 65 feet high. It's massive. 
and out in the whole front to the west of this rock where all that water would have come down. The whole general landscape is about this deep in crushed granite just as the erosion has come down. I mean, I can remember it as we were walking out there mm. with the backpacks. It makes a certain crunching noise mm -hmm. as you go along. But in this area to the west of this rock, where right in front of where these, these channels have been cut out, mm -hmm. the whole area, and I mean a large area, is blasted away to the bedrock. What would have happened if water did come from this rock and poured out down in that valley and washed all that sediment away, then it would have been laying on that bedrock and therefore wouldn't have been sinking into the sand. It would have been pooling up. And if you have a million people in flocks and herds that are already about to die of thirst, they could have all come quickly to this area and everybody taken their fill of water. It would have produced like a giant lake right off the bat. Wow. You can see this from satellite. Yeah, by you the can. Way. Oh. And you can, you can see, see the it. effect of the, uh, around the split rock, you can see where that alluvial sand has been washed mm -hmm. away. It's you, clear. You walk from that crunched granite that she's talking about into an area that's blown clean. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that could have done miracle. that would be a massive flow of water coming so down to recap, off that hill. You've got the, the, the uh, sacrificial area where they handled a lot of cattle. Uh, you've got carvings on the wall showing cattle. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a mountain here with a cave in one side of it. You've got a split rock. Mm -hmm. Do, is there any place nearby that, that shows the remains of where a, uh, a tabernacle might have been? There are on the east side of the mountain there are two specific places that we have seen that could very well be the remains of where that original tabernacle was put up. And you know, after the golden calf incident, it was moved. Mm -hmm. um, there are two areas that we've zeroed in on that are highly suspective of, of exactly yeah. that. There's, in, in, in these areas, when you move stone, when you clear an area, it can stay recognizable for thousands of years. Oh yeah. I exactly. mean that and that is what has happened yeah. here. They went in and they moved the stone and they formed this rectangular wall which would have been the perimeter of the tabernacle, an area where they would have cleared the big boulders out and it's still there today. Yeah. It's not perfect, but you can make out the rectangle and you can see that there was something there in the ancient past. Mm -hmm. You know, if if I went there and having seen this, I, I basically visited the place, but very, very good uh, <clears throat> documentary, good photography. But if I went there, I kind of put myself in that spot, I would just be stupefied. If this is the place that <laughs> yeah. it... It is amazing. Yeah. That it claims to be. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I'd be able to stand on my own two feet. I'd probably fall, I'd, fall to my knees. Did you get that feeling? First time we walked into the, uh, this area where the altar is, that happened to me. I, I fell to my knees. I could not believe, having been disappointed at the traditional location mm -hmm. and experienced all of this, that we finally we walked into that site, and it was overwhelming. And even to this day, I still think about some of these events, and they give me chills. I mean, it yeah. never gets old. We are out here, it, it, in this DVD, we try to bring you there, let you experience it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's as, I put as much energy in, as I could into that part of it. It's visual, it's video, it's an, us telling, but there's all that trying to bring you, welcome you in, bring you into this, uh, to this place so that you can see it. Whether you'll ever be able to go there, that's another question. But at least you can experience it through the DVD for now. Wow. And I did. Uh, it, it, this DVD is phenomenal. I, I want to tell you that, we, and we're offering it, it's called Exploring Arabia's Sinai. And I think it's approximately four hours, correct? On two it, DVDs. It is four hours. And, and, so. uh, and we are time limited here, uh, Jim and Penny. We uh, really are. We cannot go into the depth and detail. And you guys, believe me, they go into depth and detail. And you'll see sites. Can I just give away one that just blew me away? A rock <laughs> out there that you found that has a menorah carved into the rock. Absolutely. And, and you know, now, if nobody would do that but the Jews, right? That, that's exactly right. That's what, that's, that's what we tell people. <laughs> well, you know, how can that be a letter or, or a etching? Yeah. It's a perfect replica yeah. of a, a menorah. And when everybody it, ignores the place. Yeah, uh, they, yeah. It, it, it's as though it's not quite time yet. That's what Precisely. it is. It's the timing. That thing, has I to think. be what it is. But but you know when Dr. Kim first showed us that picture of that menorah on the rocks, it it just literally, it, we knew it had to be there somewhere. 
But he and his family found that, and I am telling you, who else would have put that there? Save the Israelites. Nobody well, else would have put that it's connected to there. the Talmudic text, and that has yeah. been proven to be uh, uh, Yahud was the ones that That's put right. that there, and Yahud uh, to the to in Arabic is simply the Jews. That's right. In your exploration of of Sinai, you have personally experienced a number of what can I call them? Sometimes nudgings, sometimes. Mm-hmm perceptions, sometimes sometimes I think outright miracles, as though God is trying to direct your footsteps. This place, uh, this place called Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, is really unique. Tell us about it. What's it like to be there? Uh, imagine you're standing there right now. What are you going to be feeling and seeing and experiencing? The place has become so utterly special to us. Literally, just as you were saying that, if I picture myself there for even two seconds, a sense of reverence and awe comes over me just immediately, just as in the first time that that we were there and and Jim's knees buckled out from under him. Um, That feeling, that sensation, all these years later has never left us. And even when we go back and we watch our own video of the place, the video even has that sense of awe and wonder about it. Um, we, because the place is not open to the general public, we've <coughs> had many multiple uh, incursions with what's called the Frontier Forces Police there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is really a desert Bedouin force. Um, they live out there. Uh, the Bedouin tell them when people are in the vicinity of this mountain, and then they come out and investigate. And uh, we've been interrogated numerous times and actually hauled off to these little desert outpost mm-hmm. jails, as it were. Um, not, not, don't picture it as a jail with bars. It's not that kind of a thing. It's just they, at gunpoint, will lead you there, usually leaving the women in the car. Myself and my daughter Chelsea were always in the car, and they would take Jim and our son Lucas, and sit them on a, a dirt floor with a coffee pot and interrogate them for three or four hours. Sure and, uh, when you say miracles, literally, um, those have happened to us. There's no other explanation for this. Um, and we go into this uh, uh, both in the book and in the DVD into great detail, but series of events that have happened to us that have caused us to be let go from these interrogations are just astronomical. Um, uh, but one of the things, I, I have to just say a little bit about this because you brought up the miracles. Um, on our first trip there into Egypt, we had an issue with the truck. And when I'm telling you in the middle of nowhere, we were in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the truck, uh, we, would <laughs> we would make coffee by boiling water by this little mechanism that you stick into the lighter. Uh, mm-hmm. And it would, it would make an element hot boil water right. and I could give him coffee because we are not allowed to drive in Arabia. So anyway, like a These 20, trips were 18 yeah, to 20 so hours. 20 hours at a time. straight driving. Right. And, and we were using this little thing a lot to keep Jim going and the, the little thing burned up the fuse and nearly set the whole dash of the car on fire. So we are sitting in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, I mean, in the middle of nowhere, we had pulled off the side of the road needing a 20 amp fuse. Now, the I'm one that was in was a tin and yeah. it kept blowing and I said well now you know we pulled over in what they call a Saudi rest area which is consists of a piece of asphalt with a garbage can. And There's no sand. facilities Middle at all desert. ever in, it, anywhere in kingdom. Okay. And, and we're there and I, and I make the statement as we're getting out of the car that, that in a prayer sense that Lord we need a 20 amp fuse. And, and I'm, I've already searched, been through this several times. We don't have it. And so we break out of the vehicle, go our own ways and do our thing. But Lucas wanders out in the desert, maybe 50, 60 yards from any asphalt. And he comes back with something in his hand. Out of and the I'm sand. saying, Lucas, what do you have? And he says, Dad, I have a 20 amp fuse. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> And he hands it to me. Lucas our son. Your son. Our son. And and Jim, being the doubter that he is, (laughs) says, oh, I'm sure it's blown. 
You know, right. yeah, sure. Well, like he would find <clears throat> plenty of views at all. No, it's it away. This is not blown. <laughs> I plugged it in. The little coffee maker came on, and away and we went. To off Egypt. we went. <laughs> so, I, from this story, I can I can only deduce That's a little that, bitty that thing, but God I mean, God knows how much Jim likes coffee. Yeah. What, <laughs> That's the truth. To stay awake driving that for twenty hours, I have to have my coffee. We're having fun with this, but. Story after miracle after miracle of this sort happens to you in that region. Mm -hmm. When I think of that region, and of course I've I've read books about that region uh, over the last few years. I've seen some of your previous productions mm -hmm. and so forth, and I always get the feeling that the spirit of the Lord is in that place. Yes, it, He's never left. It's sort of His place. And we think of of Saudi Arabia as kind of a deserted wasteland, <clears throat> but the way you tell it, in that location, it's very active. The, mm -hmm. the Lord is uh, sort of uh, superintending the place. Uh, and I get that feeling when I read about your explorations. It's its, its own mm -hmm. little ecosystem there. In, in the You're talking about in the Sinai region yeah. directly, mm -hmm. where these two mountains are. Right. There is, uh, there is um, water. Number one, you have to have water for, for anything to survive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's evidence of uh, especially on the Sinai side of a uh, waterfall that comes out of the mountain, water that comes out of the mountain. So you have pools of water as you go through this area. Um, the mountain is literally covered at the four to 5,000 foot range with fig trees. Isn't the fig tree significant in that that is a tree that um, is um, talked about in Israel in, in sure. a, a number of occasions Israel. associated mm -hmm. with Israel. And then above the 6,000 foot level, Jebel Al-Laws especially is covered with almond trees. And that's significant. Aaron's rod was made out of an almond rod. And, and you and tell us that. And budded and produced ripe almonds. Jebel Al-Laws, uh, or Al-Luz, as, yeah. Al as the they, Bedouin pronounce it. it. The mountain of almonds. Yes. It that's is the it. mountain of the well, almonds. Well, you're yeah. talking now <clears throat> about figs. That, that, that's Israel. That's right. Symbolic of Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. The almond branch, symbolic of the priesthood. Absolutely. And by the way, you uh, managed to, to I, I understand, to get yourself a couple of almond rods. We do. We've got a couple we, of almond we rods. Were, and, and let me tell you, that material is extremely hard. I cut some rods that were about an inch and a half in diameter, and they were originally six feet long. We had to cut them down to get them on the uh, flight to get back to the uh, to the to our home. But... That wood is incredibly dense, and mm -hmm. we cut those 25 years ago. They are still with that deep purple, beautiful bark on those almond rods. Has never cracked. Mm -hmm. They've never. They've. They're almost they're as if they're perfectly preserved. They're beautiful. So you you find things like this in your exploration mm -hmm. that validate the Bible. Mm -hmm. Another thing was that cedar tree. Now I'm talking about this DVD. It's called Exploring. Arabia's Sinai. It's four hours of amazing photographs of the area, amazing motion pictures, getting into places you can't possibly go, and they got there. Mm -hmm. And also, it, it, the, the narrative is just laced with the hand of God. God mm -hmm. uh, propelling you from one place to another, and you look up later and discover, hey, he wanted us to go here, and, and here we are. And I get a feeling of the supernatural guidance of God when I watch this, uh, this video. Right. Uh, there were many times you brought up the cedar tree. Uh, there's a tremendous, tremendous cedar tree. I was blown away. I mean, this is a part of the DVD you got to watch. Uh, we, we were actually blown away <clears throat> because these are not, uh, you know, had, had cedar trees just been all around the region, dotted mm -hmm. here and there over the mountains, we would have never turned aside to see this thing. Right. But there in the middle of nowhere is this massive cedar tree. It was a little bit up the mountain. We went up there to investigate it, and there are root systems that run along the ground, and there's a much smaller one up above this one but about 30 are, feet away yeah, and then another and then one to another the another uh, one to the other side of it to the so south of it there's about really 20 feet th there's really three of them yeah, there's three trees they're kind of hooked together by the root system but you can actually see these things and, and you can see that on the dvd we have satellite yeah. imagery of this you can but see but it this looks thing, very it very very old it, gary it's well you know my hobby yeah my it's hobby is uh be. in bonsai i mean yeah. i've always collected the small trees it's just something i was interested in since i've been a teen was a teenager and um so i, I 
Earlier I said fig trees at one level, almond trees at another, but I didn't mention cedar. So this was something that really stood out in the mm -hmm. landscape to us. Cedar trees are unusual. And in my hobby, I saw cedar trees as bonsai is eight to nine to a thousand years old. Uh, they did some research at Niagara Falls where they, they did some boring on some cedar trees that are hanging out of crags, watered by mist mm -hmm. that are thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. They are only this big. And this tree had a trunk that was eight feet across, yeah. had seven major branches coming out of it that were larger than yeah. my body diameter. Yeah. I mean, they were th just that huge. And you make the point that most probably this tree was there when Moses was there. Well, I believe absolutely. Yeah, I believe okay, and it's growing. With size. I don't think it was a small tree. Tell, tell us where it's growing. Exactly. I mean, on in, which mountain and how far away from? Incredibly, there's two mountains, as we described mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning yeah. of our presentation. We talk about this variance between Sinai and Horeb. Right. And we were trying, at this point, we had made the climb to the top of Sinai. Now we're trying to climb to Horeb. So we end up in the valley between. Okay. And as we're coming up, there's an escarpment. The, the, the wall falls straight off 4,000 feet but it continues up both mountains. So we're, we're at this escarpment, and this tree is sitting up that hill mm -hmm. at the top of it. By so itself. It's drawn by itself, so we're drawn up to it. Now yeah. we have to climb up about two or 300 feet in elevation to get up to it. Not straight up, but walk up. We could walk up to it. But it was so out of place, it's directly between the two mountains. It's like in the center of this area. And, and the way it's spread when you're walking up is you see all the branches as you're facing you as you're coming up to, to it. It is so large that I could literally lay down inside of the branches. And so we got video, we took pictures, and, and still to this day I'm in awe that that could have survived or nothing else yep. survived. I, I'm going to jump ahead in the video. They show how that tree has seven branches. And I'm thinking to myself, what a coincidence is this? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't, that Isn't that amazing? Something? And, yeah. you, Isn't that something? and the way you show it in the video, people can see that it really has the, a menorah shape. It does. And mm -hmm. I think it was there the, the way you tell it in the days of Moses. And we think it sure could have been. And it might be very a very special bush. Yes, but indeed. But you, can, you can't say that. Yeah, no, you can't, yeah. you can't really say it. But. It's on the far side of the desert, whether you say it's from the <laughs> east or from the west. It yeah. couldn't be more remote. And yeah. we had to climb for many, many hours to get to it. So it's definitely one of those places as Moses goes in looking or into the mm -hmm. end, watering, uh, taking his flocks with him, mm -hmm. and he comes to the far side of the desert. Yeah. This is a perfect place for it. Yep. So you have uh, Mount Horeb, you have Mount Sinai, you have a place of sacrifice, as we mentioned on mm -hmm. our previous broadcast, where cattle can be brought into cattle chutes. There are the ashes of uh, the remains of early sacrifices. There are all kinds of signs that the 12 tribes were there. The incidents that are described in the Bible are outlined in, in what you see when you get to the location. They've been all over it, around it, and through it. And, and I think by the grace of God, because uh, not everybody can just walk in there and, and start shooting pictures. It's guarded. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're telling me uh, that the Arabs essentially understand what the place is. And they understand why some people would be curious about it. Mm -hmm. And they don't want people in there. Because I, I get the feeling they'd like to keep this place secret from the West. Yes, and uh, I think it's always been that way. It's almost as though they were set as the guardians of it. In a certain way, I guess we can thank them that it's preserved as well as it is because they haven't let, you know, streams and streams of tour yeah. buses come up there and see it. So in a certain way, that's a good thing. Um, we always hope and pray that someday the Saudis would open it up to the world for people to actually see what's there. Um, but there's so much more that's there. There's a, there's a very ancient graveyard there that they also have fenced off um, that could very well be where all of the, uh, the, the ones who perished after worshiping the golden calf. This is a very remote area, and Bedouin populations for centuries would have, wouldn't and fill that up. With standing with stand, tombstones. With, with pillars standing 
as markers. Now, these don't have any inscriptions on them or anything, but they took rocks How and many, stood them. How many, would you say? Oh, my goodness. It's, it's huge. huge. It's a very, very size of a football field, at least. Mm -hmm. and, and numerous, numerous, numerous graves. Well, it has uh, graves. to be more than Bedouins. Uh, well, have... number one, the Bedouin grave is always in a, uh, in a shape of a crescent pointing towards Mecca. This is pre-Islam um, uh, era mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, looking at the weathering on the stone, I would, I would estimate easily back to 1500 BC, maybe, maybe uh, mm -hmm. 1200 BC, somewhere in that range. Just from the weathering, um, you say, well, there's no inscriptions on it. Well, they, that probably would have been uh, something that they wouldn't do at that time. They wouldn't chisel anything on these graves. But they would mark the site mm -hmm. because it would be profane for anyone to stumble into this area and pro possibly be contaminated by, you know, stepping on a, a grave. So they would, this site was well marked. These large standing stones that we see were the indicators that this was a burial zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, that's one of the questions that keeps coming to us, or it did before we started posting this graveyard, was that uh, you can't have Mount Sinai, you can't have the site unless you have evidence of a massive of a graveyard mass grave. in yeah. the vicinity. And the thing about that is also it couldn't be in the camp. It had to be away from the camp mm -hmm. in an area that was remote that would not be traveled through. And this fits all of that narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything that, that should be, it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we're talking about Mount Sinai. And, you know, it's interesting that Sinai in Arabia is mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 425. Absolutely. It, it, it's Talks. matter of factly talked about. And yet everybody puts Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, which is not Arabia. That's right. And I mentioned to you uh, before we talked here that uh, it, it, it may be that the time has not come for that place to be generally opened up. The Lord has sort of kept a cover on it over the years. Although back in the days of Jesus and the apostles, I think it was probably known for what it is. That is, they, they had a historic record of it at that time. But sometime between Jesus and, and the apostles and today, it was sort of covered up. Yeah, we think that there, there are connections between Jesus and the mountain, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. These things that, um, that are talked about, that they knew very well where this place was. Who mm -hmm. shows up at the Mount of Transfiguration? Uh, none other than Moses and Elijah, the two people that would have been there right. uh, at that site. And Jesus obviously would have been there at, you know, in that present. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it, it is all throughout that time period. So what had happened? When did God put his hand over it to cover it? Exactly. It would be, if it had been known, like in Egypt, at the traditional location, it would be a zoo. Oh, it would. There would be nothing left track. recognizable. That's right. God protected this site. I, I have to give credit, and we always do, to the Saudis for protecting yeah. this site. Yeah. It's preserved as if Moses, I always say this, Cecil B. DeMille shot the movie there, and he left the set. <laughs> Everything's the set. still there. Everything's perfectly the preserved. It is. I mean, how could that be? We're talking something that happened 3,500 mm -hmm. years ago. When people see something in this country 200 years old, they go crazy. Yeah. It's like it's a fantastic ancient find. In comparison to 3,500 years, pretty amazing. It is amazing. And now you're getting a feeling of, of what I was driving at a minute ago. There is something miraculous about that place. Uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell, that starting way back in 1992, began a series of investigations of the region of Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. They're absolutely certain that they have found the true location, complete with artifacts and structures that surround it, all of which uh, remind us of stories we read in the Bible. And of course, there's the split rock. And uh, you, you uh, on the back of uh, this particular production, exploring Arabia Sinai, <clears throat> you see a picture of the split rock. And it says Split Rock Research Foundation. You've uh, named this foundation for, for that rock, giant rock, standing up. And it's got a crack in it that goes all the way to the ground. How tall is that? Um, probably about 60, uh, 65 feet. Yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, the estimate is hard to, to know exactly, but with Leonard Moeller standing next to the rock, we were able to calculate the backside at about 50 feet, and it drops down on the front side, front side being mm -hmm. the west side 
about an additional 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So total 60 yeah. feet, a huge stone, and would have been an incredible miracle for that thing to be split and water to gush forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're talking, uh, as I've said before, everything about this place is larger than life. It's, oh. it's huge. Mm -hmm. You don't go see this, you don't climb the mountain in four hours like you can do it to traditional. Right. It takes days. Yeah. Each one of these expeditions that we made would be four to six days long. We would have to pack all of the water with us that we would need. We would be away from the vehicle in, the, in that environment. Very, very, uh, you know, not trying to dramatize it, but very dangerous for us to be out there. No 911 in Kingdom no way to get help people we couldn't even tell people where we were going yeah there was only one or two individuals that had a letter that <laughs> described the place where we would be if we never came back do you think of yourself as brave no I'm, you know we were so hardy I, I, no, <laughs> I, I, I lit, my first scripture that i memorized was trust in the proverbs 3 5 and 6 Amen. trust in the lord with all your heart number one Lean not unto your own, who, who am I to understand what's going on here? Acknowledge yeah. God in everything that you do. Acknowledge the Lord in everything and that he will direct your path. Mm -hmm. And that's what I stood wow. on every time. And we also have uh, people that were praying with us yes, and indeed. for us. They may not know the details of what we were doing, but they yeah. covered us with prayer. And we believe that. Yep. There was a divine, there was angelic presence when we were out there. There had to be. Covering us and surrounding us and, no and holding the it. bullets back, if you want <laughs> to say that. And to get the true feeling of it, you really have to share the, the DVD. There's just no other way. And uh, in this uh, DVD, Jim and Penny have lots of time, four full hours, mm -hmm. to narrate in detail. And by the way, it takes lots of detailed narration to, before you'll understand where they uh, went, what they did, what they saw, and bit by bit, it, you're going to be blown away. That's all I can tell you. I was, you will be too. Now, let's get to the good part, because as you get to the end of this DVD, <clears throat> you yes. find artifacts, and you find uh, things that were carved on rocks. Yes, indeed. And the one that really, really gets to me is the footprints. Tell yes. everybody about the footprints. This is probably my favorite uh, topic with regard to all of this. You know, uh, right up there in the, in the center of the land of Midian, what you find is all these amazing things around this mountain, but there's so much more than that. We didn't just explore right around that mountain. We went there 15 times, but numerous uh, punches down into the deep desert in Arabia. There's a mm -hmm. deep desert down in the lower quadrant called the Rub al Khali. Uh, in Arabic, that simply means the, um, empty, uh, quarter. the empty quarter. But there, it, there's so much more on the Arabian Peninsula. And we, when we very first saw these footprints that you're talking about, we saw them around the area of the split rock. But in, in progressive years of uh, traveling, we have seen them all around Arabia, and this has actually mm -hmm. been uh, ground proof by others. And they're just on flat rock, they and are they are sandal rock. prints they, with a little yes. notch where you would have a, your, toe. your toe. And two side pieces, straps, two which side would show straps. the latchets. Now, that is specifically a sandal. That's not what some would call a uh, Neolithic you know, uh, foot tracing with the little toes. These are sandals that are marked on these rocks and they are marked all around the Arabian Peninsula, and that's highly... That's a lot of country. Yes, indeed. It's a huge country, it is. Yeah. A third the size of the U.S., actually. All, so for 40 years, they wandered not just in one little place, but all that's around exactly the South, right. what's called the Saudi Arabian that's Peninsula. That's exactly right. It, how, it would be an astronomical coincidence to have a promise to a certain people, as detailed in Deuteronomy 11:24. Mm -hmm. Wherever you place the soles of your feet, I will give you the land. And here we have a peninsula that is covered with sandaled footprints, not, not feet with toes, sandals, specifically sandals. And if uh, our good friend, Dr. Kim, who also worked in Arabia, mm -hmm. who he and his family went 12 times to this mountain, he could speak fluent Arabic and the Bedouin literally told him when he asked them, who put these here? They spoke by Arabic back to him, Yahud. And Yahud in Arabic means the Jewish the people. Wow. They literally mm -hmm. told him the Jewish people put these here. 
So where, where do you go with that when you have a coupled with a biblical scripture that literally says the promises with the sandal footprints? What's the other thing that's kind of amazing about that, God also, it, it's, it's marked very clearly, their clothing did not wear out for 40 years and neither did their shoes. And I wonder, of course, that's the graciousness of God, but I wonder if it's not because they needed the soles of their feet to mark exactly where they had been because at some point in the future, this was going to be found and discovered. So 3,500 years later, what they engraved on the stone is still there. Yes. That's some kind of engraving. How does that work? <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> well, in a desert environment where you don't have any uh, erosion or corrosion or, any, or any weathering from the rain, um, these things, these things last literally forever, yeah, and uh, and the petroglyphs on the rocks, the cow uh, bull petroglyphs, mm -hmm. they have been there for multiple thousands of years. It is interesting too, is that in, in the um, Islamic term of erasing the signs, they only erase what they recognize, and what's happening is these signs are there that were not recognized, so they weren't destroyed. Mm -hmm. And again, I call them the chalkboards of history because wow. these ri this writing is now starting to speak to us. Mm -hmm. Jim and Penny Caldwell, what adventurers they are. And this four hour DVD is, uh, is yours it, for only $34.95, two uh, DVDs. I have been through all four hours and loved it. I'm telling you, you'll learn a lot. But more than that, you'll, you'll feel it right here. When you, suddenly you'll take a breath and say, wow, God is still working in the world. Amen. And, and that's just am the amazing thing. <clears throat> also the book, uh, God of the Mountain, uh, exploring uh, Arabia's Sinai and God of the Mountain, 1995 for the book, 34.95 for the DVD. And if you want what we always do here at Prophecy Watchers, a full package, we're also providing the Exodus case by Leonard Muller uh, with pictures by the Caldwells, it, all through it, and uh, Tim Mahoney's Patterns of Evidence uh, on the Exodus timing, timing of Egyptian history, and all of these items, and you'll see them right there on your screen, together, $99.95, which is a considerable saving over buying them separately. We're calling it the God of the Exodus Passage, Go to prophecywatchers.com, click on the online bookstore, scroll down, and you'll find them. Well, we have only seconds left. Jim and Penny Caldwell, it's been an experience for me. May the Lord bless you in your coming work. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. For thank having you so us. much for having you us. You are it's been a really pleasure. a great time. More than welcome. I'm Gary Stearman. It's been an adventure, and the adventure goes on. Keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody.